We have a quorum and we'll start the, the meeting in open session. Can I begin by welcoming members uh, to the meeting and advise members of the need to maintain social distancing during the meeting? And can I also provide a brief overview of the day's business? The committee today will consider subordinate legislation and have a departmental briefing on the road safety strategy. Can I also advise members that due to the witnesses and some members joining remotely, that it would be helpful if members use the hand up icon uh, to register that they wish to speak or ask questions at each agenda item. Uh, also, if members and witnesses could mute their mic when they're not speaking, that would allow everyone to hear the evidence and to follow the meeting. Can I also advise members that the room must be vacated by 12 o'clock uh, at the latest? Uh, so I request that members keep that in mind when asking questions. So first agenda item is apologies. Uh, I have an apology from George Robinson, MLA. Do you have any other apologies? Cahill Boylan, please, Chair. Okay, uh, there's Cahill Boylan uh, down as an apology. Sorry, I think Andrew Muir. And Andrew Muir, I'm hearing. Andrew. Yeah. Okay, so I've received apologies from George, Cahill and Andrew Muir. Uh, I have no other apologies, I think that's everybody. Uh, Agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. Uh, could I begin by welcoming Patrick uh, to the Committee of Infra for Infrastructure and uh, look forward to working with you on your, when, in your time here. Uh, agenda item number three, which is draft minutes. I'd pay, could I turn members' attention to page six uh, of the draft uh, minutes of the meeting on the 22nd of September 2021? Are members content that the minutes are true and accurate reflection? Are we agreed? Unless it's a up, Chair. Chair, just at one point, I had asked in under AOB, um, I'd raised the issue of cleaning and maintenance um, in rural towns and villages, um, and just had asked for an update from the department on, on the resource um, that is being put into those, you know, for, for, for that purpose, because it's certainly it's something that's been raised with me that there's, um, you know, there's it's there's a lot of work out and weed spraying and things like that. And I know it's not I was I was said that I didn't want to take away from the staff on the ground, I just was trying to get an update on what sort of resources being put in by the department. Okay, well Liz, I, I'm happy if that's a proposal to second uh, that, that that we ensure that we get uh, a response from the department, what sort of budgets we're talking about there in relation to uh, to that general maintenance, if you're content yeah. with that. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's just because it hadn't been included in the minutes from last week, but I had raised it under AOB. Thanks, Chair. Okay, okay members agreed with that action point? Yeah. Agreed, okay. Yeah. And I'll just sign the minutes here. Okay, thank you, members. Um, could I now move to agenda item number four, which is matters arising? Can I turn members' attention to page 14, matters arising from the meeting on the 22nd of September 2021? Can I ask members if they have any issues arising from the meeting? Any members wish to raise any points? I suppose it goes on the back. We have raised an issue there from Liz that will be followed up on. Any other issues? There was obviously sure. that was raised as well about the situation last Tuesday in relation to the MOTs yes. and whatnot. Have we any up-to-date report on how things are panning out at this yeah. moment? We should get an up We ask for an update, so we should get that for yeah. next week's meeting. Next week. Members will know that, and I'm sure you all had it in your individual uh, constituencies, but there was quite a, a, a considerable delay in the new system transferring over. I've heard uh, a lot of uh, commentary surrounding that uh, in relation to the reasons why. Um, I suppose probably we as a committee, we, we have had evidence session for, sessions from both the Minister and DVA. Uh, I, I think there is considerable cause for us to, to monitor the situation with DVA, uh, particularly as they've transferred now on to a new system that has added to, to a, a, a backlog that already existed. Uh, you know, I, I have had the stories where people have actually been charged but weren't given an appointment slot. Uh, I've heard other ones that we heard in the chamber where cars and vehicles that the, you know, the system was claiming did not exist. So with any new system, you're going to have technical glitches. There is no doubt about that. Um, but we we sort of we sort of need to see 
what stress testing testing was put in place before this system launched and then further to that is it now working adequately and are we starting to see those numbers come down uh, because I suppose whether it's MOT testing or indeed driving tests there are considerable pressure points uh, for many across our constituencies that we're going to have to keep our, uh, an eye on so I would I would suggest uh, uh, vice chair uh, if, if you wish to propose that we write to DVA to get an update on the new system and the stress testing that went beforehand and how it's coping now I'd be happy to second that proposal uh, uh, chair, Sorry, just it's, uh, I, I believe the minister did say that there had been considerable progress in, mm. in, in terms of the reduction of the waiting times and the waiting lists. So I, I think if, if we were to, re I think we we're receiving an update next week anyway. I don't know what point the stress testing, but I'm just curious. Uh, okay. You know, given that, if, uh, I think it's right that we continue to monitor yeah. uh, customers' access to okay. the service. But it's my understanding it, it's much improved. Yeah. Okay, and, and I, I'll take that point. My, my point in relation to stress testing was that I did receive uh, informal evidence from, from some uh, people within the system that were, were telling me that there, was, uh, there wasn't the adequate stress testing done on the system before it went live. Normally, with a, a, a system such as this, which would have cost millions, there would have been a, a degree of maybe it was, a, I think, the. the um, I forget the name of the company that actually provided the service to the department. I think it's Fiducci, if memory serves me right. Uh, but was there stress testing done to ensure that once it did go live, that it was able to keep a pace uh, with the demand of the system? The other point to, to raise on that would also be that um, was the department aware of any initial challenges that the system would face uh, and is it now adequately dealing and eating into to the backlog? Those are sort of questions that I would like to know so we can get a bit of a background and see if there is progress being made. So that's a bit of context to that. Well, that's helpful. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Are members content with those action points? Great. Okay. So I'll move to uh, page 17, which is outstanding committee requests for information. Uh, so members will see there for themselves. Uh, we have quite a number uh, of outstanding uh, correspondence responses. I don't know if members have any. We, we actually have some particular on MOT as well. Um, is any member wish to, to raise a point in any of those outstanding correspondence requests? No? Okay. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item number five, which is correspondence. And can I draw members' attention to uh, the memo at page 34? So, can I ask, uh, uh, is there anybody wish to discuss the, the correspondence memo? Any members wish to raise a point? No, I don't see any. Okay, so. Um, is the committee content with the actions as suggested in the correspondence memo? Members content? Great. Great. Okay, thank you. We now move to agenda item number six, which is subordinate legislation. SL1 is not subject to assembly procedure. Can I advise members that there are two proposals for statutory rules not subject to assembly proceedings at page 102? At page 103, the one-way traffic Ballinur Order Northern Ireland 2021. And at page 106, uh, the parking places on roads and waiting restrictions Dungannon Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2021. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Content then? Okay. Thank you, members. Uh, I think we are now moving on to agenda item number eight, which... Sorry, seven. I'm just checking. Oh, sorry, that's not right in. Right. Members, just hold for a moment. Just on this one. Sorry. Okay. Agenda item number seven: uh, the subordinate legislation SR is not subject to assembly procedure. Can I advise members that there are four statutory rules not subject to assembly procedure at page one one five? Uh, there have been no changes to policy content since the SL1s were considered by the committee. At page 116, SR 2021-263, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions Antrim Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. At page 121, SR 2021-264, the Prohibition of Waiting Schools Amendment Number 2 Order, 
Northern Ireland 2021. At page 124, SR 2021 265, the Urban Clear Clearways Amendment Number 2, Order Northern Ireland 2021. And at page 127, SR 2021 266, the Parking Places, Loading Bay and Waiting Restrictions Down Patrick Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2021. Are members content with the statutory rule? Great. Great. Thank you, members. We will now move to agenda item number eight, which is a departmental briefing from the Road Safety Strategy. I could turn members' attention to page 131, which is the department uh, briefing paper for the Road Safety Strategy, and at page 136, the department press release uh, on the launch of the 100,000 grant scheme for community-led road safety initiatives. And can I also let members know that Hansard will record the meeting. But before I welcome the officials online, I'll go to Roy, who has a question. Just declare an interest as a treasurer of Carnic Fergus Road Safety Committee. Okay. Thank you. And Chairman of Carnic Fergus Road Safety Committee. Okay. Uh, so we have a couple of declarations there that have been noted uh, by the clerk. Okay, so Hansard will record the meeting. At this stage, can I welcome attending via Starleaf, uh, Dr. Chris Hughes, Director of Safe and Accessible Travel, and Ms. Caroline Hobson, uh, Principal Officer, Safe and Accessible Travel Division. You're both very welcome to committee this morning, and at this stage, I'll hand over to you for your presentation to committee. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members, for this opportunity to talk to the committee. Um, just I'll give a brief presentation, as, as, as you said. Um, just. Uh, First of all, um, it's, I think it's important at the outset to make clear that uh, road safety is integral to the work of the department. And while the strategy is one of our key key tools and key uh, uh, the key planks in that, um, other work on, is ongoing on a regular basis. And for example, the minister has introduced uh, road safety uh, measures such as the 20 mile an hour around schools. Um, as you mentioned there in your introduction, uh, Chairman, the uh, road safety grant scheme um, she has also introduced penalties for mobile phone use and um, there's ongoing enforcement by DVA. However, um, the Minister has always made it very clear that there's absolutely no room for complacency in road safety. The implications of any adverse event are so serious and every death or serious injury is a tragedy and it has repercussions beyond you know, into our community for those affected as members will, will be well aware. Um, the last strategy was um, Extended um, the, uh, the the impact of the COVID crisis meant that we were unable to uh, do the strategy to replace the strategy, which was uh, due to expire, until, which ran until 2020. Um, in common with many countries across Europe and indeed all of GB and Ireland, there was a delay in bringing forward a new road safety strategy, um, and we are now uh, working on on that. Um, the department uh, prioritised, for example, the uh, financial support schemes for uh, COVID uh, impact. Um, and, but however, as I said at the outset, the, the road safety continues to be a priority for the department just every day. The new approach is, uh, the new strategy is going to take an outcome-based approach, OBA, which uh, members are probably familiar with, as that is the one that the draft programme for government takes. Um, the focus is on what makes a difference, but it's important to realise that ongoing road safety work continues. So nothing that's going on stops. It's just trying to identify those uh, factors and issues and actions that will make the biggest difference. Um, this is a different approach and may well lead to fewer targets in the in the next strategy. <coughs> Excuse me. Currently. Um, we are working at pace uh, on developing the strategy after that initial delay. And um, we started in the summer with a pre-consultation um, with a number of bodies. Uh, the minister agreed that we would talk to the statutory bodies. So obviously key among those were the Blue Lights, uh, the PSNI, the Fire and Rescue Service, and the Ambulance Service. Um, also other government departments, the local councils, um, and the health trusts. We also uh, took the opportunity to meet with um, other road safety groups who had been in touch with us or wanted to be in touch with us. <coughs> but with the, um, the, the uh, safety valve, uh, um, this is an advance of a full consultation and the full consultation will give everybody with an interest in road safety the opportunity to have their stay in a full and proper consultation process. Um, as a result of that consultation, that pre-consultation process, there was a lot of support for the OBA approach. 
um, and identified that people recognised that the key causes of um, road traffic collisions remain the same, principally their human error, and that is set out at paragraph seven of your briefing paper, uh, Chairman. Um, there was a lot of keen engagement and passion, as has been our experience with everybody involved in the issue around road safety. It's people recognise the importance of it, the impact of getting it wrong, and the importance of getting it right. Um, the key challenges that were identified in this pre-consultation are set out for you in paragraph 8 of your briefing paper. Um, <clears throat> they reflect the causes, and they are the things that people thought that we should look at identifying in the new road safety strategy. So addressing road user behaviour and the need for change, which comes under an education type um, intervention, enforcement, um, road vehicle, road and vehicle safety, so your engineering aspect of it, um, the infrastructure, and also uh, something that came up particularly was rural roads, as well as issues particularly affecting both young and older drivers. Um, and what also identified by uh, the pre-consultation event was the fact that we have a very wide range of road users that need to be considered, particularly as the minister is looking to promote walking and cycling. So we've got the young and elderly uh, road users and pedestrians, as well as other vulnerable road users. We have, for example, motorcyclists. And one of the issues that came up very strongly, as you would have anticipated, was the needs of rural of rural. Uh, of rural uh, road users and citizens, the rural population. Um, I wanted to give, take this opportunity to give the committee an update on what the plan next steps are. So we are currently now preparing the full consultation document, um, which will launch in November. Um, the, the plan then is to analyse the results of that consultation. Uh, the Minister is intending on publishing the final uh, road safety strategy before the end of this current mandate, which will the publication will take place next year, given the timing of the consultation. And today we were hoping to take the opportunity, Chairman, with your uh, permission, to hear the views of the committee before we go to the full consultation, and also where we where we are able to to answer any questions that the committee may want to put to us. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hughes. Uh, I don't know if Ms. Hobson has anything to say before I, I go to members for questions. Um, I would just really reiterate what Chris has um, um, put across, you know, and really coming from the pre consultation engagement, the key thing was the acknowledgement that our roads are a shared responsibility. Um, everybody you know, uses the roads, everybody has an impact, and it's down to us to make sure that our actions prevent ourselves and prevent collisions and um, occurring towards other people. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And can I thank you both for coming to committee? Obviously, road safety is, is something that we as a committee and indeed as elected representatives take very seriously. Uh, so it is timely that we have you before the committee this morning. Could I congratulate the department on the rollout of the 20 miles per hour zones at schools? Uh, I think that is an extremely uh, productive uh, use of resource, uh, given the challenges that many of our uh, local schools face with <laughs> increasing numbers and indeed also uh, busier roads. So, so that is welcome, and I would be keen to see that further pushed out, and I know there is an intention to do so. Um, could I also just say, I suppose from the outset, and while I appreciate and welcome that there has been a downward trend in all of the key target areas that you've highlighted in the paper, but given that all four targets have not been met under the 2020 targets, were the targets too ambition, or ambitious, or was the strategy not fit for purpose? Um. It probably, uh, I mean, as ever with these target setting, the ambition is has to be key to, um, I mean, the, the title of the Road Safety Supporting Campaign is the Road to Zero. And I think that, um, you know, the decision was taken at the time to have that strategy as, um, as ambitious as possible. Could there be more done? Well, absolutely. And that's why we're looking at uh, re reviewing the, the strategy and looking at what, what we can do to improve things better. When you get to um, a certain stage in uh, tackling behavioural change, there comes a point whenever you um, 
have to tackle more deeply embedded behavior and more difficult to reach. And I think possibly we're at that stage. That doesn't allow for any complacency, but it does mean that perhaps the issues we're trying to tackle are actually harder to address. So um, I think that just what we're hoping to do is make sure that that final bit that we want to get is addressed in this upcoming strategy. And so we're looking for very much to hear ideas and welcome views on how, what we should be looking at to, to take that further down and improve on the situation. No, I, th I thank you for that. I suppose probably this is something that we, we have to be we have to be realistic in our target setting. So that so that we as a committee can then judge performance based on realistic targets. Um, one thing, and I, I put my local cap on here, and I'm sure Dolores uh, will mention it as well. Uh, something that I've seen, I think one of the key uh, drivers of road safety is making the, actual, the driver much more aware of their speed and their surroundings. And one thing that I've noticed in conjunction with PCSP locally in, in, in the ABC council area is the rollout of SEDS, the speed indicator devices. And this is something that I think the department should be taking a proactive look at an arrangement with, with all councils, particularly in rural areas where you're starting to enter more urban zones, uh, whereby a speed indicator device can, can work in twofold. Number one, uh, it makes the driver aware of their speed and automatically you do see a reduction whenever that light is flashing red. But also, it does help with the collection of data uh, for departmental um, officers in relation to pulling together some of this, these trends, etc., and also to help better target resource to ensure that we have a safer road. So that's something that I would like to see a much more proactive targeting from the department, working in collaboration both with local councils and beyond to try and see a, a much larger rollout of the speed indicator devices, because I, I think it will prove uh, successful. Can I ask the department uh, to advise how much money has been devoted to the implementation of the 2020 strategy and have the cost for a new scheme been calculated, advertised, uh, or advertisement and enforcement, etc.? So um, I don't have figures for the implementation of the 2020 scheme. I would need to go back and see if um, implementation figures per se are available. Um, one of the issues there is that um, road safety is integral to the part of the department is to the work of the department and um, so I would, I would need to take that back chairman and have a look but um, I'm, I, I'm not sure on that uh, because the idea is certainly to make it just part of what we do as far as any costing for the new strategy uh, at this stage it's way too early for us because we actually don't know what the strategy is going to be we're very much at that development stage where we are looking to see what um, you know, we have to go through the consultation stage, analyse that, obviously take away the views and uh, um, consider the issues that you raise here today. So it's uh, it's too early to say what that will that will be like, Chair. Okay. You mentioned in paragraph three of the briefing that the pandemic and the lockdown have impacted on the monitoring figures. Could you maybe expand further in what sort of discrepancies are in terms of uh, disparity that we, we're looking at here? Yes, the, um, the the main issue there was that uh, there was a, there was an, a, 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 if you recall, um, chair and members, there was a great reduction in the volume of traffic on the roads. So that was a distortion in itself, and then also the, the behaviour of those who were using the roads also altered. In that, while there were far fewer users, there did seem to be an increase in people driving above the speed limit. So there was a, a different circumstances, and we saw anomalous behaviour at that point. Okay, thank you. And my final question before I'm going to members is, uh, when do you think the new strategy will be in place? So it, uh, the Minister is wanting to get it in place before the um, end of this current mandate. As I said, the consultation will launch in November. So just allowing for the time for the consultation to run for us to provide our analysis and advice to the Minister. It will be obviously in the new, uh, into the new year before the, the before they uh, can lodge, but before the end of the mandate is what the Minister is aiming for. Okay, thank you, Dr Hughes. And I'm now going to go to members for questions, so I'll go firstly to our Vice Chair, uh, David Hillich. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just, just on the funding issue there, the grant, does that have to be spent within this financial year, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. The COVID one's been asked. Uh, I made my declaration at the outset of the meeting, but it would be remiss of me not to mention the road safety committees which operate locally. Uh, the road safety committees which operate locally. Um, going back to the 26 council model, there was obviously virtually one in every council area. 
Under the new council structure, I'm not so sure that's the case, but many people work in a voluntary capacity at that level, and they work quite well with the officials in each area that they're operating in. And for instance, the pilot scheme for the 20 men an hour was was put in with uh, in Carrick Fergus at the model school in the Belfast Road, and that work that was the committee working with officials to to, to make that a success. Um, the departments up here. The road safety committees and the voluntary bases are down here. Okay. What sort of engagement do you have? Or are you aware how many road safety committees there are even across the province currently operating? Or so um, we had our engagement with the local councils. Um, was uh, one of the things that the minister had agreed to in our pre-consultation engagement, and the, it was the councils who decided who would represent each each of the organisations. And we had several of the uh, elected members as well as. Um, officers from the councils who attended the, the pre-consultation meetings with us, and some of those were from the uh, road safety partnerships. Um, one of the things that the feedback we got was that actually um, there, there was, they highlighted actually quite good cooperation, um, both with the statutory organisations such as the PSNI and the ambulance service locally, as well as the local departmental representatives um, from the road service. So I would need to check my, uh, I would need to absolutely check to see if there was a road safety partnership in every single one of the local government areas. Uh, Caroline, perhaps are you aware of that? Um, I know we've met with some of the police and community safety partnerships and uh, they you know, were representing sort of from the road safety aspect um, and we have very good engagement with them. Um, I think it's maybe important just to highlight at this point, you know, one of the key reasons we're applying the OBA, the outcome-based accountability approach, is because going forward we're very, very keen, you know, as part of OBA you're required to work collaboratively to co-produce, co-design, you know, the actions and measures going forward and as part of that process then we will be engaging with those stakeholders um, and making sure they're involved in this process and um, I can't reflect on the previous strategy but what I can say definitely going forward it's a big commitment of ours to make sure that they're you know involved and part of this and get their buy into this because you know we acknowledge that they're the ones who have the local knowledge what's happening on the ground I mean and it's so important and again through the engagement you know there's so much work that's going on out there at the moment, and there's so you know there's so much dedication and support for road safety, and we want to be able to pull that all together and basically exploit that because it's in everybody's interest really. So there's definitely a commitment going forward that will be happening. That that's good to hear because as, as chair of one of the local groups, I to say Roy's treasurer here, it it just doesn't seem to be it seems very disjointed because we the local council don't really sort of talk to us either, you know, and is the Road Safety Council still operating as well across the province? There used to be a governing body for the Road Safety Council. Have you heard of that? No? No. No. Um, was it possibly the Road Safety Forum? No, it was, it was, it was termed, no. I don't want to the 26 councils, it was termed the Road Safety Council. Uh, now, they would, no, have been, so. they would have been an umbrella group for all the local road safety groups that are operating across the province. So maybe you can check that out as well. Yeah. Okay. I just. Um, I would also add just on, under OBA again. You know, part of that is a requirement for us to put in consistent reporting and monitoring arrangements and the governance around the strategy. You know, that those sort of things will be considered. You know, to make sure that there is um, appropriate reporting, monitoring, government structures in place. Um, so it's definitely something we will take into account as we move forward with the strategy development. Okay. Thank you. And finally. It was very frustrating as a, an elected member and others who would serve locally. It used to be the policy where you identified a, a, a real problem area, but there was this policy whereby there had to be a fatality before mm. anything was taken into account to happen mm. to improve that situation. Is that, is that still the policy of the department? The um the, the response for um, the response uh, this was this was actually and it's very helpful that you raise it because it was something that was raised in our pre consultation so I mean it's it's very helpful that you raise it again the response to um, to issues at this point in time is data driven so and um, there has been some issue raised about you know how well is data recorded that is a near miss for example so I think that is something that has been raised at, and now, Mr. Hildesu, you have raised that. That is something else that we will be we will need to be looking at. I think as we move forward in developing this new strategy. 
Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, David. And I would echo those comments regarding. I think there's nothing more frustrating, both for constituents and elected members, whenever uh, they're requesting work to be done because they know there's an evident road safety issue, and to have to <coughs> reply, look, there's no fatality history at this site. You know, the first thing that that goes back uh, to the department is. You know, you're literally you're wanting data about, uh, you know, fatalities before you do anything. We're telling you there's an issue, and which could very, very really lead to a fatality. So I think that is something that should be taken up, and I'm glad that the vice chair has raised that. I'm going to go now to Dolores Kelly, and then Roy Beggs and Liz Kimmins. Uh, thanks, chair, and I would uh, concur with you around the SID devices. I think they've been particularly helpful, particularly in rural areas uh, where speed limits are going up to 85 miles an hour through the village of Marilyn, I believe, in the recent SID. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wonder, I mean, uh, there's a huge issue around enforcement. A lot of people tell me, uh, and we know uh, that uh, previous chief constable, uh, as a result of austerity measures, reduced the number of police within traffic branch and enforceability. So I just wonder, in terms of the department, any signals, if, if you like, that they've got from the PSNI in the round enforcement, particularly around those hot spots where the SID has produced those stats, whether or not those then are shared with the police to, to look at um, um, maybe doing some um, um, speed monitoring uh, themse themselves and enforcement. The other bit, Chair, I would like to ask, and I know this isn't popular, but, and I do come from a rural area, but it has been raised with me, the increase in uh, size of tractors and farm vehicles and the speed at which they can travel on roads and yet there's no requirement or you know or checking around licenses because there have been reports of people who are under the age of 16 driving such vehicles I just wonder where that factored in to the thinking I know it's not popular but it is an issue of concern that has been raised uh, with myself and the other uh, bit uh, that I wanted to ask was around uh, DOJ and the Community Safety Board because others have mentioned the road safety committees, etc. But I think uh, a previous minister actually stood a number of those down. I think it might have been your party colleague, actually, Minister Putz. I'm not 100% sure, but I think I'm fairly sure on that one uh, around the community safety. So I wonder, in terms of the, the community safety aspect, how much input <coughs> is there, I suppose, to, to the department uh, that feeds through PCSPs? If any, or, or or will they be part of the broader consultation period when launched? Is that where that comes into play? Okay. Okay, so um, just you know, pick up on a couple of issues there, which I'll address in turn. So the first one is the uh, the targeting of speed enforcement is an operational matter for the PSNI. So that is something that the the, the PSNI do on an operational basis. Um, uh, thank so you. Uh, I'm aware of that, but my point was, if they, I know the PCSP gather the information, but within the strategy, is the sharing of information, and so that the, all of the intelligence around where the key areas should be around enforcement are black spots. Because you and I both know that the majority of people who go into the hedge in a rural area, the local farmer, somebody pulls them out and it's not a reported as a hot, you know, a yeah. black spot. And, and I think also in conjunction with that, and I'll let uh, Chris come in now, I think with the SID device, yeah. the information yeah. does go to the PSNI, if I'm if I'm correct yeah, in saying so. So there is, there is a, a well, a, there is now an issue as to how that d data is then shared with departmental officials to ensure yeah. that we get an accurate picture. That's correct. Sorry. Sure, yes, that's it. Thank you. Um, and obviously, uh, to take the fundamental the underpinning point, which is the sharing of information, I think is coming across quite strongly here, and that's incredibly helpful. Um, so yeah. thank you for that. Um, that's the first time that anybody has raised the issue about um, the size of farm vehicles. So again, thank you for raising that issue. That's now on our radar. Um, and um, sorry, sorry, I've forgotten the final point that you had raised. Well, oh, sorry, there was one actually point I've written down here until I remember what the other one was. I just wondered what the evidence was. You know, Chair, uh, about new developments, and there's a constant constituents coming and looking at speed ramps, mm. but they're not part of the planning design. Mm. And yet, housing associations, whenever they're doing the planning design of new developments, have to take advice from community safety within the PSNI. I just wonder about planning design uh, uh, for speed. You know, because you hear about rat, you know, the rat runs, you know, yeah. uh, and new developments, and whether that could feature within a strategy in terms of a policy uh, development. Uh, um, 
Yeah, that was that one. I'll come back to the other if I remember. It was about DOJ and the Community Safety Board, you know, and oh, that yes. bit about the, the piece about um, the community safety strategy and how that links across to road safety. And, and to link in with Dolores' comment, and it, it may be helpful, but when you're talking about the size of vehicles, in particular, uh, you know, agricultural vehicles, yeah. I think it would be important also to raise an increasing issue now, on particularly a lot of our rural roads, is that the rural road is not built for the quantity or size and scales of vehicles. So, for example, uh, you could have rural roads where uh, buses, Ulster buses, whatever, are, are going up the, the rural road, which is pushing people towards the verge, which in itself has dangers. So I think maybe, suppose, yes, we can mention size and scale of vehicles, but I suppose quantity of vehicles, to a recognition that some rural roads are not built for for the volume and size of vehicles that are using them. Okay, yeah, thank you. So um, I, I, I welcome both those points and we will take those away. Okay, and what was your point in relation to DOJ? Well, there, there's a community safety board now established which is doing its strategy. You know, I just wonder uh, how that links across to PCSPs and community safety and because a lot of the accidents of, and fatalities, I believe, are, and I think the evidence suggests, are in rural roads. Mm. You know, and and you know, the how long has it been from the uh, criteria for design or improvements in real r rural roads has been assessed, and how is that assessed against okay. what the accident history and intelligence is telling us? Okay, Dr. Hughes. Is there any follow-up comment in relation to that, or is that just supplementary to, to, to go away with? Sorry. sorry, was that me, Chair? Yes, indeed. Oh, sorry, I th I, uh, apologies. Um, with that, we will take that away, and one of the uh, people we will be speaking to, obviously, is the DOJ, so we will uh, we will, we will lift that point and take it up with them. Thank you for that. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. A brief comment on um, that. You're actually coming in now, right? Okay, so, uh, Roy Beggs, just for uh, questions. Uh, on the issue of um, large vehicles that are farm vehicles and, and rural <laughs> roads, the clarinet is my mum and dad of a small family <laughs> farm. Um, but I am aware that uh, the economics of farming is that fewer farmers are buying farm equipment because they can't afford it, and it's, there's a move towards contractors. And contractors do things the more, most efficient way, which is larger items. Okay. So uh, I don't know how uh, uh, the department will regulate uh, that industry and where people have a right of way to get their, their, their property. So uh, complicated. It is. I accept that. <laughs> okay. Um, turning to the issue of excessive speed, which um, um, uh, you've indicated is a major factor in road safety and, uh, and there's a, uh, accidents. Uh, we do have the Road Safety Partnership and the PSNI who occasionally then have their own speed checks, but certainly like others, I have a high regard for the speed indicator devices, the SIDS, yeah. which are, are been very effective in rural areas, particularly where um, um, there may be lower levels of population and, and uh, police are less likely to get there and the Road Safety Partnership vans um, um, also are less likely to get there and may not even be able to be located safely in the rural area because frequently that, that's a problem. So my question uh, on SIDS is does the department have any data showing their effectiveness because certainly um, anecdotally and from what I uh, see and hear reported they are very well received by local communities and they seem to be effective, particularly when they are moved about and people just don't take them as part of the, the picture they're driving by. Um, so have, has the department any uh, data on the effectiveness of SIDS? I don't have any data on hand, uh, Mr Biggs, but I can if you wish take that up and, and see what there is available. Okay. The, the other issue that's relevant around SIDS, I understand the department doesn't allow uh, local communities or for that matter um, uh, community safety partnerships to uh, fix the SIDS to lampposts. Um, so uh, in, in my area they tend to be located on small trailer units which themselves become an issue because they're parked at the side of the road. So my question is given that the public interest in having these located and located somewhere safely, why are they not being allowed to be located on a street lamp post? Uh, I, I don't have an answer for that either. I'd have to consult with uh, road colleagues on that one. Uh, 
Okay. So I can I can do that. Okay. Um, turning now to um, uh, 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 main causes of, of accidents, there's, there's speed and there's also, you've said, driver error. Um, I'm just curious to what extent um, has vehicle failure, mechanical failure, contributed to accidents? And in particular, over the past year, when many vehicles have only been tested over a two-year period, whether... Um, the public have maintained their vehicles despite not having to have an MOT test, and has there been any significant change in accidents as a result of those MOT exemptions? Yeah, the um, the issue about um, uh, mechanical failure is a tiny, tiny percentage. I think it is actually something. It is point. It is point something percent of the cause of accidents, and that has not been impacted and is not showing through in the data as having a, 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 an increased causal effect on accidents um, since the uh, delay, people delaying and getting their MOTs. So it's a tiny, tiny percentage. The, uh, the main issue is driver error. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to learn that. Particularly, there's a consultation live on that issue uh, presently. Um, now, you've said the department is taking a zero risk approach to road safety. Now, uh, uh, there, there is a, a, a theoretical risk of uh, extending MOT exemptions uh, that uh, they could contribute. You're telling me that is not any significant risk uh, from the data that you have. So my question is, given the pressures on the MOT system at the minute, why does the department not continue to use um, MOT ex exemptions rather than have the huge pressure on individuals uh, to try and get MOT tests when they're, they're not easily available. And do you recognise that when particularly uh, members of the public in the rural community cannot get their MOT tests, they are forced to walk on rural roads and that in itself is a risk factor? So are you, is the department taking the risk of people in rural communities having to walk because of lack of MOTs, uh, contributing to adverse road safety, and basically, why do they not use uh, MOT exemptions, C continue to use them at present? So um, thank you. There's a, there a number of issues there which I'll, I'll try to unpack for you, Mr. Biggs. Um, as, you, as you said, there is a consultation ongoing at the moment about extending the uh, time period over which, um, over which MOTs are taken. So, uh, and that consultation um, is on extending from annual to two-year MOTs, and that consultation closes on the 19th of October. So after that, we will be able to do an analysis of the evidence. It's a, sorry, it's not a consultation, apologies. It is a call for evidence. Uh, sorry, that's, that's wrong. It's a call for evidence on that. So the next stage would be consideration way before we would get to a consultation on that. Sorry. Um, so that is that is something that we are looking for evidence to see what the impact of that is that, that people have. Um, the, now, some of those uh, issues are operational for the DVA, and I, I know you do raise those with the uh, chief executive. But um, I know that one of the issues that has been looked at is um, where people have got uh, managed to book an MOT, they can continue to use their vehicle as long as they maintain it in a roadworthy condition. And there's been discussions with the PSNI, so that that will not be enforced, is my understanding of that. Um, so that does allow people to continue to use their vehicle as long as they're seeking to get an MOT and they maintain it in a, in a safe way, which is always the responsibility of the driver. Can I highlight the problem from those, and I have been contacted by a constituent who may, as you say, continue to drive their vehicles, but they cannot get it taxed. And they then risk uh, uh, fines for having an untaxed vehicle on the road. Um, uh, uh, so it, it is not a, a, an issue that is working. There are pressures on uh, particularly people in the rural community, also people in the urban environment who, who have uh, cars that they cannot get taxed. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to that, as it's not it's not something that we're looking at as part of this strategy. That's an operational matter. Yeah. So um, I would be straying beyond my knowledge, yeah. Mr. Beggs, So okay. uh, which wouldn't be helpful. I think yes, no. I think um, points points well on on the record, uh, and I think probably in development on one of Roy's points in relation to SIDS, and from what I have seen locally in, in my own constituency, the the partnership with the PCSP, and I, I would hope some partnership with the department, but I'm not sure if that is the case, but we can come back to it. 
was now the move towards permanently fixed SID devices within rural areas, particularly in the ABC council area. And I actually think that I've, I've seen the trailers, which is predominantly actually more focused towards the PSNI in terms of moving the trailer with the SID device around, but a permanently fixed SID in a recognisable location uh, does have an impact. Uh, and also the data that is recording will also feeds in uh, to where where the black spots are and, and probably one of the uh, and speaking informally to the PSNI about this one of the one of the, we've had serious speeds going through villages but out uh, uh, sort of anti-social hours as well so people think that there, there's no risk so I think uh, we can learn a lot from them and I think that their inclusion in any strategy going forward could be essential. Okay, I'm going to move now to uh, Liz Kimmins for a question. Thank you, Chair, um, and, and thank you to, to Chris and Caroline for, for their answers so far and for the briefing. Um, some of what I was going to say has been covered, and Mr. Hollich had actually mentioned and others around the, the partnerships with the local safety groups. I know in, in Newry, the Road Safety Committee for Newry Morning Down do excellent work and actually have done their own um, surveys and stuff, which were really, really good in, in kind of um, picking up what the key issues are for this area. Um, so, I mean, if there can be more partnership work done with them, I would certainly be advocating that. I think they could play a very prominent role in future strategy um, because they are so clued in and they've, they're really passionate about what they do. Just, I suppose, in, in relation to that as well, um, with the road safety grant scheme and I mean with the last one I had been working with some groups on the ground including the road safe uh, partner um, groups was there you know I am conscious that quite a few people had um, been turned down for them and I suppose it's because they weren't too sure what the remit was or you know what they could apply for and what, what what missed the criteria are there any lessons learned from the last call about how to get the money spent and to make sure it's been put to effective use um, you know, with community groups. Uh, and before um, before you come in on that one, I think that's a very important question, Liz, and I suppose as community representatives, um, you know, there is a desire out there for um, a, a grant scheme such as this that has been provided, but only if it's effective for our community road safety. So just to add to, to Liz's question, uh, what types of projects would be fundable? Uh, and also do community groups apply to the department? So I'd like to see just a wee bit more um, information on that so that we can get to a point, as Liz says, that the, the budget that's allocated is used effectively because we know in times past it hasn't been fully utilised. Um, I, I'll respond to that one. So basically, the Road Safety Safe Travel Grant Scheme, so there's a budget of, you're probably aware, £100,000 allocated to that each year. Um, in terms of last year, um, everybody who applied and met the criteria actually um, was able to avail of the funding. Um, so that's you know the position um, and probably in terms of the criteria maybe there was a misunderstanding in terms of what sort of projects and initiatives you know could actually be funded that um, going forward this year the, the scheme for this current financial year was launched um, last Wednesday on the 22nd of September it closes on the 15th and the applications close on the 15th of October and already we've received quite a few inquiries you know with regard to the scheme and eligibility requirements and that has to be met so as a department, we're very, very willing to engage, and I mean, we've already organised a few Zoom meetings with different community groups. So feel free, you know, absolutely get in touch with us. We're very happy to take any comments to provide any clarity in terms of what actually the requirements for the scheme are. So in terms of the actual requirements, so it is actually it's for groups um, that are in the voluntary community sector, and they can apply for a grant of up to ten thousand um, pounds, and it's to run projects which are aimed at improving road safety or indeed the uptake of active travel. So the community can apply to youth groups, schools can apply, community groups can apply, um, and the sort in terms of the sort of um, the, th the same schemes of the sort of thing that has been um, paid for in the past. So we've had. Um, projects funded that have addressed issues relating to like the safe sharing of road space, motorcycle safety, um, modifying cars safely, um, driver safety advice and training for younger and older drivers. And as Ms. Kimmins mentioned, their road safe NI last year, you know what they used their fund, they were um, successful and they actually um, produced a highway code for children. Um, which is really um, well received in the in primary schools. So they're really, really beneficial initiatives. And you know, we're like I said, we're keen to work with um, 
with people, the community groups, anybody's interested, and you know, to work with them to clarify maybe what the eligibility criteria. In short, really what it is, is we need to see that there's a specific issue that needs to be addressed and what their idea is in terms of how to address it and then how the proposed project will actually contribute to our road safety strategy targets um, and indicators. Um, the other the key thing is, I suppose, it's to make sure that any projects that can't be replicating what's already done within the department. So, you know, as you're aware, the, the department already runs certain schemes and schools. Are, um, so basically, it can't fund anything in any capital projects. So if anybody wants, for example, speed ramps or things, capital M projects, it won't fund those because they're already being done by the department. So I suppose it's, it's for things that are done over and beyond the department and really to tackle local issues at a local level. Um, so that's the key thing. And in terms of promoting it as well, you know, again, we had the formal launch last week and we also put it on the website um, and we also work with some of our um, stakeholder groups um, and the Rural Community Network is one, the Northern Ireland um, Council for Voluntary Action, NICFA, they're um, actively promote the scheme for us as well. So um, hopefully that gives you an idea. And in terms of the previous um, last year, an example of some of the, the um, projects that benefited our organisation. So we had um, Belfast Healthy Cities, um, I mentioned Road Safe NI, um, Colin Neighbourhood Partnership, um, and Cycling UK. So there is a variety you know, of people who have applied for the scheme and been successful. And you know, we aim to anybody who completes the application and meets the criteria, hopefully will be eligible for the funding then. Yeah, no, thank you, Caroline. And I suppose last year, I just know from because it was relatively new as well, two of the groups uh, that I had been working with were trying to apply, they thought they could have got a set or something like that through it. Okay. And that's um, you know, and it actually I thought I know the PCSP are rolling on right with in partnership, but obviously there's a waiting list um across the PCSP areas. So they kind of thought that would have been a really good one. So unfortunately, because it deemed as a capital uh, project, but they were able to review what they were applying for then with, with, in consultation with the department. But something maybe we could think about in terms of how, because that would help to support I suppose, where there's maybe gaps as well. Um, I think cause we've all talked here today about the, how effective SIDS are. Um, and Dolores had mentioned there, like I know, I've been like it for many years now, and I mean, everybody wants ramps in their their own area, um, and it's it, they're, they're hard to get. Um, so you know, if we can look at things like that, maybe we, you know, it might be useful as well, especially for smaller groups that don't have the manpower to deliver big big projects. But no, thank you for that, Carney. And chair, chair, just a couple of other questions. Just in, in addition to the, the stuff around the 20 mile hour zones outside schools, which I think is very successful. I know my colleague Chris Hazard had introduced that as a pilot um, during his um, time as minister, and, and it's something that I'm very passionate about. I mean, is there any indication of a future rollout for the, within any future strategies then as well? I mean, I would certainly love to see it outside all schools. Um, and I had expressed a wee bit of disappointment in, in the most recent call out because there were schools, just I suppose I can only speak about my own constituency, that have actually got traffic camera measures in place but were included, whereas there's schools with very little traffic camera measures outside that, that are st will, would really benefit from it. So it's about trying to look at, um, look at the, those types of areas and how we can make sure that they're prioritised going forward as well. Um. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is obviously something that um, I mean. It was, it, it, we now are, are getting the data from the effectiveness of those pilots, and it's something that uh, we will thank you for raising. We will look at as we as we develop the strategy. Yeah, and well, that's good. I think it's just. I mean, I, I probably am like a broken record at this stage, Chris, but um, I do think it's a really, really good scheme, and the, the further we can um, broaden that, the better. Um, is, there, is there any um, consideration given then to the development of walking and cycling infrastructure around school areas as a specific action me measure within the new strategy, just in, in, in addition to that? Uh, I, I mean, as I said, we haven't actually developed the strategy yet, so we're very much at that consultation stage. So, I mean, if that's something you want to raise with us, that's something we can take away from today and look at. Yeah, and no, I think that would be would be good, particularly as it ties in with the, the Minister's priorities around active travel as well. I think it's um, school safety is, is probably a key issue for us all, so if we could look at that as well. And just my final points in, in relation to the, the 2020 strategy and some of the targets within it, um, and looking at the four targets, 
I think it is good to see such a reduction of uh, in fatalities or, or those who have been seriously injured um, from the baseline figures. But at the same time, um, the latest figures shown in, the, in this report show that we have fallen short of some of our targets. So it was just to see if you have any kind of, if there's any indication of why we haven't met those targets, I think it is good to be ambitious. But just if there's any factors you think that maybe have contributed us not being able to meet those. Um, I think the problem, as I said at the outset, I think we're getting into the stage of we're getting the hard to deal with. Um, I mean, you will know about public campaigns, for example, the vaccine campaign is sort of having exactly the same issue where you can get to a certain percentage and then things require perhaps a different approach. Um, there, I mean, there have been no targets set, as I said, because the strategy hasn't been developed. It is something that um, you know will need to be considered. Would you want to actually increase the targets for... Um, you know, for saying actually no, we're going to say that it, it's it's an acceptable level of um, killed and seriously injured to, to go up, or you know, or with that. The, I mean, the uh, international um, the international consensus is basically, as I said, road to zero. So it is about even to try and get none to happen. Um, it is regrettable to the extreme every time we fall short of that, um, but. Um, I mean, it's one of those things where it's very interesting. To, I mean, to hear to hear your views on. Um, I mean, this is something that we would appreciate the committee's thoughts on. You know, those strat the, we haven't set targets for that. What are the what would the the strategy like us to consider? Yeah, no. Well, I mean, it's it's not it's certainly not a criticism because I know it's not an easy thing to do, and I do think we do need to be ambitious. I mean, when you're talking about it, it, it is life or death in a lot of these um, cases. So. You know, I do think we do need to be. I suppose I was just trying to establish whether we've any, you know, do you think we need more robust action measures or more resource and funding um, to try and effectively make those targets or get as close to them as possible? That's really just what I was, you know, just based on what you're, when you're analysing the figures, can, has anything been, been identified that you could say, well, we need to do more of X, Y, and Z? Well, I mean, this is the stage we're at now where we're trying to work through exactly, exactly those, and that's why we welcome every thought and comment you have. Yeah, no, that's grand. Like, thank you, Chris and Caroline. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. And can I go now to Patrick Delargy for a question, please? Yeah, so just looking at the information on the study, there is clearly a disparity, as you've highlighted, between those the number of those killed in more affluent areas, or, or sorry, more deprived areas compared to more affluent areas, and I'm wondering, you know, while that went down in 2019, is there a specific strategy in place to target that and to make sure that there is, um, I suppose, a, a strategy in place really to target deprived areas in particular? Because while it has dropped, the rate of those killed or seriously injured in deprived areas is still significantly higher. Uh, I mean that is something that we can we can certainly look at. Um, we can certainly take that away and have have a look at that uh, as an issue. Um, as I said, the strategy hasn't been developed yet, so we're very much in listening mode here. Um, and the the other thing then was just around the A5 and, and delivering it because obviously in its current state, it's one of the most dangerous roads in Ireland. Um, so I was wondering if there's anything specific that you are going to include in the strategy in terms of making sure that large-scale infrastructure projects like that are managed and to make sure that with those there's, um, I suppose, a move towards improved road safety? Um, the, uh, we, as I said, we haven't decided on the strategy. The aim is very much to have it high level. So um, the, the A5 has been identified, you know, the various um, key projects that they um, the executive have identified are going forward, and they obviously they contribute to part of that. But again, we're we're very much in listening mode. If that is something that um, that the committee and members would would like us to take away and consider, um, you know, uh, road safety underpinned a lot of the, a lot of the road works that that is ongoing. Um, so we would need to see how that could be fitted into a strategy that is high level. Um, perhaps one of the things, just reflecting on the deprived areas, I mean, it may well be that as we look at trying to tackle that sort of rump. Of, um, of of remaining killed and seriously injured, maybe that is an angle that you know would help us and help us adopt and identify a new approach. So I mean that's helpful that uh, you've highlighted that, and that's certainly something that we can take away as well as looking to see where major road infrastructure infrastructure projects fit into that. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. And just a, a couple of follow-ups to close up on, on some of the things that members have mentioned. Um, and I think it was Caroline that was dealing with the Community Road Safety Grant Scheme. It would be useful for the committee uh, to be supplied with a, a briefing document of the do's and don'ts, should we say, of the scheme. Um, you know, what type of projects have been fundable in the past, uh, most successful, and indeed that, that, that process. I think I, would, I know you're You've indicated that you're willing to do Zooms, which is very, very helpful as well if we have groups interested. But perhaps a briefing note to the committee and exactly uh, spelling out you know, what the scheme is applicable for would help. Uh, to, 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 I think it's on the website, as Dolores is indicating to me, but could you please provide that to the committee uh, directly via a, a briefing note? Another point uh, which has been raised both by Dolores and Liz, and I think it's a fair point, uh, there's always a real community drive for, for ramps. Um, now, one thing I suppose that I, I would like to see included in the strategy is, you know, is there any models of international best practice? Is ramps the best way to, to reduce speed and therefore road safety? Or is there other ways? I suppose probably what I get constantly is, they know that ramps are effective, but they don't like, uh, <laughs> they, they, can be, they, they can destroy the setting of a, of a, of a development or whatever it may be. So, and I suppose I would fall into that camp myself. Uh, so I would like to see um, coming forward in the strategy, maybe you can say it now, maybe, maybe you know or maybe you don't, but what international models of best practice is there in terms of the best way to, to reduce speed? Is it, is it ramps or is there other ways? And if there is other ways, uh, you know, can we explore them? And another final point, and I think it relates to something that Roy had mentioned in relation to uh, MOT testing and its impact. Obviously, the Minister has announced a consultation on biannual MOT testing. And I suppose what would be important that we factor in evidence from uh, DVA testers as well as to, to what they're seeing on the ground and how that might impact upon road safety if we go to a model like that. The jury is still very much out on it, that consultation, and I would encourage everybody to, to feed into that. But it's just that we're we're having a, a direct comparison uh, and feed into the, the, the strategy going forward. Yes, I would, um, thank you, Chair. Um, just to pick up on those, I would need to uh, I would need to talk to my roads colleagues about the effectiveness of various traffic calming measures. Um, um, so I, I I would have to look at that operational detail on that. Um, yes, on the on the two year biannual MOT call for evidence, we have looked at the evidence that is available from the almost if you like partial real life test of the system, so that the evidence from the DVA um, will feed in. And finally, I think. Um, and the point Mr. Beggs made as well is that there's an awful lot of local energy and enthusiasm, and other uh, committee members have made the local knowledge and enthusiasm is something that clearly we want to we want to try and capture. I think, uh, Chairman, did I did I pick up on all the points that you wanted me? I know. I think you have picked up on the adequate points, and Caroline, I think, was nodding in agreement regarding the briefing note on the scheme. Yes, uh, absolutely. One one other small point as well, which has been raised. Obviously, we know, and we will be receiving a briefing on this next week in relation to uh, the crisis facing the HGV sector. Uh, and anecdotally, uh, listening to a lot of those that are leaving the industry, sadly, that the, the most common factor for a shortage of drivers is actually those retiring from the industry. And on listening to them, uh, there seems to be quite a, a level of. Um, Dis, well, dispute among themselves and the way in which the VOSA uh, are applying, um, you know, their own regulation. They almost feel that the, the industry is now so heavily re regulated uh, that it, it is, it's become a case now where it's driving people out of the sector. And I was just wondering um, what conversations are being had uh, with the likes of VOSA, because obviously there's an issue here of we have the police that are regulating our roads and road safety as well and enforceability, but also the likes of VOSA. And I wonder what conversations or what feed-in there is to a strategy in terms of taking into account the challenges facing the, the, the whole age industry at present. Um, some of those issues that you touched on are actually, um, some of them are devolved and some of them actually are impact across the, um, the, the whole of the UK. Um, the, uh, we are in constant contact, daily contact, multiple ta multiple occasions with our colleagues across uh, in Westminster and in all the operational bodies there. 
Um, some of the issues that have been raised, um, and this is something we've accessed through the media as well, is the fact that the trade bodies who represent the drivers and represent the industry say that the issues are, um, are part to do with the terms and conditions and the oper operation. You are co absolutely correct in saying that many of the drivers are not retiring age. Um, and I think the average age for drivers in the HGV industry is 55. In GB, they have a different um, they have different issues that they're addressing. They have a shortage, for example, of HTV tests, which we don't have here. So um, there's issues that are devolved and issues that, are, that apply across the whole of the um, all of the UK and indeed actually beyond into Europe because you know, by their nature of, of what they do, um, these drivers actually are, are, are you know, cross the borders of every description. Um, Okay. No, I, I, no, I appreciate it. Just for as for a point of information, I know you may not be the, the direct person to ask in relation to that, but thank you, and can I thank you both for your briefing to the committee this morning? It has been very helpful, and I think it's something that's very real to a lot of members, and something that we all collectively will work towards uh, a better and a more safer environment on our roads. So thank you both, and I know that you will follow up with those those after points uh, at a later date. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, uh, you've heard uh, the briefing on road safety. I think we had quite a productive discussion there uh, and some useful follow points. And I think uh, that going forward, this is something that the committee will keep a, a watching brief on as such. Uh, and we will probably indicate, I should have said it to the officials, but I think what we will do is we will wish to ask uh, officials to come back after the consultation mm -hmm. on the results. So I'm aware that I've let them go before I've said that, but we can write to them. Are members content with that action point? Yes. Mm -hmm. And has any member a point that they want to, to raise that has come out of the briefing? Members are content. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, we will now move on to agenda item number 10, which is our, our forward work programme. Uh, and can I draw members' attention to the proposed draft work programme for the next meeting? It's at page 139 of your meeting packs. Um, can I remind members that the strategic planning meeting had been postponed uh, due to members' availability? I suppose this is something that I really want to push on members, and I know that you're here in person today. Um, the fact is that this is something that's very important to the work going forward of this committee as it goes forward towards the end of the mandate. Uh, I can't do a strategic planning day on my own because there's no point in that. Uh, Just you'd love to. Yes, and uh, a small number of members can't either. We have to have the buy-in of the entire committee. So could I please uh, say to members that uh, when we do uh, rearrange for a strategic planning day, which I think it's being proposed now for the 13th of October uh, as an alternative date, that members do their best to please attend and attend in person if you can so we can have a productive meeting and ensure that we, we properly um, set forward our plan for, for the future. It's for members' benefit uh, as well as indeed the department's benefit mm -hmm. that we have a structured programme of events forward. We've also have been looking into the potential of getting out again with the committee, which I think members are very keen to do so, and I know uh, the clerk has taken advice as to what we can and cannot do. So I'm very keen to ensure that we do that, but I need members to attend and intend uh, specifically at this meeting, so I know you'll all take that point on board. Uh, could I also advise members that it would be a discussion, if, as I've said, if they attend in person for that particular meeting. Okay, so I'll go now to agenda item number 11, which is any other businesses, any other business, and uh, I'll ask members if they have anything they wish to raise. I do have one, and it was raised by members uh, at the previous committee meeting uh, with the Minister, and that was rela in relation to the planning legislation uh, guidance note that was put down by the Department of Local Co Government. Now, you will see in correspondence that we did receive correspondence back from two of the councils, and this will help as we move towards actually a briefing which we have scheduled in for, I'm just checking it here, we have scheduled it in for the 13th of October, a briefing, a uh, departmental briefing on the, an update on planning, which will help. Uh, but I note in one of the correspondence, I think it was from Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, that they've talked about the, the letter of representation that they received from the Ulster Farmers Union. I think it would also be important for us to, to write to the Ulster Farmers Union to gain their um, expertise on this issue and if there is issues outstanding following the department briefing on the 13th that we could potentially hear from them uh, at the committee to ensure that we as a committee can, can get full knowledge 
an, a, an appropriate way forward. So before I take other members... Oh, so, so it's just maybe to include the Rural Community Network? Yep. Uh, in terms of... We could also write to them for, yes. for their experiences. I, I'm, I'm trying to gather up as much information as possible before we actually have yeah. the departmental briefing. So I'm happy to include that. Is there anyone, anybody else that would like included that we could write to on that particular issue? So we wrote now to councils, the Ulster Farmers Union, the Rural Community Network has been mentioned. I think that's an adequate uh, picture that we could be gaining from, yeah. from, those, from those sectors. So members are content with that action point? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, we did have a couple of other points. Was it Roy looking to, to raise? Uh, no? Uh, chair, I just had. Sorry, uh, uh, it was just around the Infrastructure Commission mm -hmm. appointment. Um, an OTO meets this afternoon and it's the executive. As I understand it, the minister has to, you know, left it with the executive, mm -hmm. um, First and Deputy First Minister. I just don't know why we haven't seen any advancement on that uh, because I think it, it would help in terms of our. For, you know our overall strategy as well, uh, and, and could we find out when we might get appointments? Yeah. Yeah. No. Look, I'm happy to, to put that away. I would also, and I suppose because some of us are newer to the committee as opposed to others, um, if possible, I think the committee. I, I would like to see a list of appointments that have been made in the mandate. Uh, to, to the variety of bodies within the Department of for Infrastructure's remit so that we can gain a full picture as to, to where the backlogs or where the delays are. But again, with the Infrastructure Commission, I'm happy to include yeah. that in that list uh, that we could, we could write to the Department on. So are members content with those action points? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you, members. That leads now to agenda item number 12, which is date, time and location of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 6th of October 2021 in the Senate Chamber Parliament Buildings. Can I also advise members in the room of the need to maintain social distancing while leaving the meeting and to ensure that they remove all their own papers, water bottles and glasses, etc. from the meeting room when they leave. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.